Hey everybody, Mitch with Smedley Plumbing here, and as promised, we are going to be giving you guys a in-depth ride along with us with our new Ford E-Transit to see exactly what kind of range it gets now that we have it fully loaded, fully built out, fully weighed down with our standard build out that we do for, for our plumbing van. Stay tuned with us and you are gonna get to see all of our experiences throughout the day and we're gonna find out exactly how far this E-Transit will travel on a single charge. We've got it 100% fully charged. We're gonna go ahead and undock our level two charger. This is the Ford Connected Charger. It runs about 900 bucks plus installation. It needs a 60 amp circuit in your house or business or whatever you're going to use for it. Uh, it needs a 60 amp circuit to power it because it will continuously feed 48 amps into the unit. If you don't have a full 60 amps, you can actually dial it down through some settings in the charger and get it to, to match whatever power you have available. So we're going to get this guy disconnected. We'll put our dust cap back on, get our hatch door closed there, and we are ready to roll for the day. We are ready to roll. Let's get this puppy fired up here. We're gonna be able to show you guys quite a bit of stuff here. We've put about 700 miles on the unit total. Again, this is the new Ford E-Transit. Our model is a 148 inch wheelbase high roof. Uh, it is not the extended length. What really affects the efficiency of the unit is the height of the roof, not necessarily the length because that's the amount that you're having to push through the air. Go ahead and uh, uh, take a look at our dash here. And you can see up in the up in the top corner, top left corner, we've got 695 miles on the unit. Down here at our at our range, it has adjusted to how we're driving it, and it says fully charged. We're going to be able to go 122 miles. We're going to put that to the test today because we are loaded down. Another thing that we're going to do for you today is we're going to go across the weigh scale and weigh the unit. If if you've watched our previous range video, we've done another one of these range videos where we were driving around 100% empty with no weight in the back. Now we're fully loaded down. We, we spared no weight savings or anything. We loaded this van just like we load our other gas units. So we're gonna go across the weigh scale again and we're gonna find out exactly what it weighs, what our load weighs, and how that affects our range. One last thing before we take off is we are going to reset our, our trip. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually reset both trips. So we're gonna come through and come down to trip two, and we are gonna reset that one as well. There we go. We are zero miles on the trip odometer, and we have 122 miles of range available. We're gonna put it to the test and see can we go 122 miles loaded down like we are. All right, we've made it to our first stop. We're a whopping two miles into our journey. It's Wednesday here in our company. Every Wednesday, we take our entire company out to breakfast. That's our first stop is a local restaurant here in town called Sandy's Restaurant. We are gonna go enjoy a meal with the team and then we'll get on with the rest of our journey. One of the other things that I wanted to, to show you guys today that we did not showcase in our first video is down here on the gear shifter. We've got our standard gear shifter here but then we have a button in the middle of it with an L on it. That L mode is actually really crucial into extending the range as far as we can extend it. That L mode forces the regenerative braking to go at 100% every time you let off the gas. In the first video that we showed you guys, we were kind of showcasing how tapping the brakes can increase the regenerative braking but with the L mode, it puts it at 100% all the time. And it doesn't quite give you one pedal driving, but with a little bit of practice, you can really, really hone in on the regenerative side of things, let it really extend its range. So we'll show you a little bit more of that later today.
We just had breakfast and now it's time to get on with our day. We're trying to dedicate most of today to giving you guys this fully loaded range video, but we are still a plumbing company and we have a little bit of work to take care of. So before we get too started with the range side of things, we've got a service call to go run. So we're gonna knock that out. You guys can come along with us on that. We're gonna go knock that out and then we'll get on with our day. For starters, as, uh, as we're making our way through the, the range today, one of the things that we are doing today that we did not do during the unloaded video where the van was empty, we're using L mode. And that is this button on the center of the gear shifter. It's kind of up in the air on what L actually stands for. Maybe it's low range, I don't know. There's no transmission in these E-transits. What L mode does is the moment you let off the accelerator, it allows 100% regenerative braking to take place. And you, you have to turn that on every time you put the unit in drive. So if you just jump in the van and put it in drive and take off without putting it in L mode, you get a van that will accelerate like normal. And then when you let off the accelerator, it will decelerate like a normal gas car would. And what I mean by that is it will coast. When, again, without L mode, if you tap the brakes one time, it will apply 30% regenerative braking. If you tap the brakes twice fairly quickly, it will apply 60% regenerative braking. And if you tap the brakes three times fairly quickly after letting off the accelerator, it will apply 90% regenerative braking. That, that's kind of to ease people into the transition of driving an electric vehicle. If you just push the L button and put it in L mode, then every time you let off the accelerator, it will apply 100% of its regenerative braking force to help slow the vehicle down. And that does a couple of things. One is you're recharging the battery as much as possible every time you slow down. The other is it allows you to kind of change your behavior for how you drive the van. You won't use your brakes very much at all when you're in L mode. It changes your, your stopping distance just a little bit. You have to start slowing down just a little bit sooner to allow L mode to do its whole thing. It's, it, it gives you the most range possible. And so we're gonna be in L mode all day today because it does give us the most range we can get out of the unit. Another thing that we're doing today that we did not do in the unloaded range video is we have the van in eco mode. There's three different driving modes that you can pick for the van we can select between normal, eco, and slippery. The biggest difference between normal mode and eco mode are going to be the fact that normal mode, if I floor the accelerator, push the pedal all the way to the floor, it's going to give 100% power to the electric motor. And the van accelerates very, very quickly. In eco mode, it seems to limit the power available to go to the motor by about 50%. The van still accelerates perfectly fine for perfectly safe driving and everything else. It just helps kind of offset the fact if you have like a lead foot and you like to accelerate really quickly. If you are concerned about range at all, you can put it in eco mode and the van will override your aggressive driving inputs. Basically won't let you have a lead foot. I don't typically have a lead foot anyway, as these vans will we'll show you guys later. We have a bunch of things on shelves in the back of these vans. You end up having to drive fairly smooth, otherwise you'll throw your stuff all over the place on your shelf. Having it in eco mode really isn't benefiting me too much because I kind of drive softly anyway, but it is a feature that you'll want to have selected on your van if you are concerned about range. We just hit stop number two for the day. First was breakfast. Now we're gonna do a little bit of plumbing work. We've got a customer here with a clogged kitchen sink drain line. We're gonna go knock that out. And then here a little bit later, we're actually gonna give you guys a tour of what's on this truck and what comprises of its weight. And so that way 
when we see that as we're feeling different things with the auger. But, oh, well, so that's not bad. That's pretty good. That means that we'll probably have some success today with auger. And the whole night... We've knocked out our first service call of the day. Now is a great time uh, to kind of give you guys a tour of everything that's in this truck. And then we're gonna head to the weigh scale and weigh it so we can kind of show you guys what it weighs. First off, we are in the cab of the truck. One of the things you'll notice if you watch our different video, we've got our nice bulkhead in place here. Bulkheads are incredibly important. Uh, if we were to get into an accident or anything else, the thousands of pounds of stuff behind us is gonna try to smash us. So that bulkhead is really important at making sure that we stay safe. Other things that we have in here, we've got, you know, pens and paper. We got our, we've got, you know, pens and paper. We got our tablet, which runs all of our dispatching stuff uh, for, for all of our service calls and everything. We've got some stickers and everything for customers, you know, garbage disposals and water heaters so that they know who to call. We can keep our customers' floors nice and clean. Improvised cardboard box trash can, and then just another box full of some other goodies in here. Some, some antibacterial wipes. I work out quite a bit, so I've got some protein powder in here throughout for, for me to have throughout the day. Some business cards and all that stuff. Never a shortage of water on the truck. We've got water everywhere. And then some sunscreen. Back behind the seats, got some other stuff here we've got we're in the midwest so today it's 90 degrees outside but you know just about a month and a half ago it was snowing so we've got all the stuff for snow and ice and everything else never can be too prepared that's really it here for the cab let's jump in back and see what we've got back there let's take you guys inside and see what a well-stocked plumbing van looks like so first thing you'll notice as you come in here good tool bag Full of all our hand tools i kind of refer to this as my go bag 80 to 90 percent of repairs i'm going to make in somebody's house i can do it with these tools here i've got some other specialty tools on the truck we don't use them all the time so we don't bring them in the house all the time next thing is buckets plumbers will always have lots of buckets and lots of towels because most of the messes that we're working with are wet so we need places to catch water and dry things up moving right over to here we've got three different sewer machines on the truck these are the, the machines that allow us to run a cable down the drain line and open the drain lines up. We've got this big one here for main sewer lines, the line that runs from your house out under the yard. We've got this medium sized machine here for mid size sewer lines, larger lines within your home. And then there's actually a smaller machine under the shelf behind here, and that's for individual sinks. Pull this forward here, you can see back there. That's gonna be for like kitchen sinks or, or bathroom sinks or something to that nature. So moving on up here, we've got a couple of these specialty tools. We, we like the Milwaukee tools. They do really well for us. Things like battery powered tubing cutters and battery powered PVC cutters. And then there's even a circular saw back there. Got some towels here. And then up here, move this down here. Up here, we've got a lot of our faucets and fixtures that we may be putting in somebody's house. You know, kitchen faucets, bathroom faucets, tubs and shower faucets, and the whole gamut. Sometimes the customers will provide their own faucets, sometimes we provide them, and that way we're really prepared. So let's move on back in here a little ways. As we're moving back in, right here, we've got a water heater on the truck. It's a 50-gallon natural gas water heater. It's the most common water heater that we install. We keep one on the truck ready to go at a moment's notice. Uh, because you never know when your water heater may break. Here we've got a lot of PVC fittings to, to replace and repair drain lines. Every, every single one of these bins is organized with different PVC fittings. Here we've got some adapter couplings to go from different types of material, maybe cast iron to PVC or copper piping to PVC or something of that nature. Going on down, here we've got some water heater repair parts. So we've got new elements and new thermostats and new gas control valves for water heaters. 
Here we've got some soldering stuff. Uh, we're we're kind of set up for a couple of different types of water line repairs on the truck. We can solder, we can uh, do the flexible PEX piping, and we can also do Pro Press. Here's kind of our setup for that. We got pressure regulation valves here. This is our toilet rebuild shelf down here on the bottom. We've got things for wax rings and new flappers and new fill valves and, and all new guts for toilets and everything else. Down on the bottom shelf, here we have our ProPress machine. This is what lets us do the ProPress copper connections. And we've got some towels. Let's move back to the back set here. Kind of back out of the way a little bit. Okay, so on this shelf here on my left, we've got some more PVC stuff here. And here we have what they're called blow bags. These help us clear drain lines that are full of like sludge and grease and stuff like that that are kind of hard to auger with. We've got some small electrical components here. Plumbers have to do a little bit of electrical work every now and then as we're maybe working on a sump pump or adding a tankless water heater to somebody's house. Sometimes we have to run an outlet for that. Next shelf down, we've got some faucet repair stuff here. We've got some Moen rebuild stuff and some Delta rebuild stuff. We've got some Sloan valve stuff here for like commercial toilets. Next one down here, Again, some more PVC stuff and some more like washing machine hoses and sump pump check valves. Next shelf down, we start getting into our copper repair stuff. So here is where we have all of our copper stuff for either solder or pro press. I've got them combined in my bins here. I'm actually in the process of getting things converted over to these bins here. They're also made by Milwaukee. It makes it a little bit easier to keep things organized. These on this side will be in bins like this very soon. Next shelf down underneath that, we've got a couple more water line items. We've got things like yard hydrants and stuff like that. And then we move to gas line stuff. If we ever need to make a gas line repair, we've got things to do that. We've got flex connectors for appliances and we've got rigid gas pipe fittings over there. On the bottom shelf, we have several different garbage disposals. We keep four or five different garbage disposals on each truck. And then we even have a couple of sump pumps here in case your sump pump goes out. Moving over to this other side, We've got a top shelf here that has things like extension cords and garden hoses and bicycle pumps. We've got, you know, some contractor's trash bags and hand broom. Got to keep our job site nice and tidy. Next shelf down, we've got some anchoring stuff. So we've got some pipe clamps and hangers. We've got some screws. We've got some more hangers here. And then we've just, uh, this, this kind of gets to be where it's kind of the catch-all side of things. We've got some things to rebuild some faucets and hose bibs here. Next shelf down. Here is where I have all of my PEX fittings, the flexible plastic lines. Um, I've got my PEX fittings in these two bins here. And then we've got some carry over leftover PEX stuff. We've got some water line hangers. Sprinkled throughout the truck, you'll notice that there is flue piping, water heater flue piping. And we just kind of have to put that in wherever it fits. So we've got some four inch flue piping here, some three inch flue piping here. Back on that first shelf, we have some four inch and three inch elbows on, on that section there. So, and we've even got a little bit more over here with some adapters and some caps and stuff like that. Next shelf down, we have kitchen or, or any sink drain tubular stuff. So we've got P-traps, we've got slip extensions and tail pieces and, and everything else that we might need. We've got some basket strainers for your kitchen sink and, and stuff like that. Here we've got some different various kitchen sink sprayers. Uh, we've also got some tub spouts on here. Next shelf down underneath that is kind of our chemical and, and again, catch-all area. We've got a bin for chemicals that will have glue and primer and WD-40 and leak detector and anything else that we might need liquid-wise. We have some gas pipe fit or some gas pipes over here, some pre-cut to length gas pipe stuff. And then we've got some Sawzall blades and some miscellaneous other connectors. So we've got some escutcheons here for when piping comes out of the wall. We make that connection look nice and pretty. We've got some brass compression fittings here and then some brass threaded fittings. And then we've got a bin for caulking and silicone and everything else. Here we've got some uh, specialty tools. You know, for me, I've got some Dremels and some Roto-Zip tools here. I've also got some multimeters and gas leak detectors and stuff like that. Improvised trash can, again, plumbers are really good about using cardboard boxes for trash cans. Behind all this bottom shelf here, we get into some more tools. So we've got a rotary hammer drill on the bottom for any time we need to drill through any kind of masonry. This is my bag full of heavy specialty tools. So I'll have things like PEX crimping tools and larger pliers and, and a grinder and things like that in there. Back over here, we've got some different kind of work boots. So I've got mud boots if I'm slopping in the mud or I've got work boots if I'm digging ditches in the dirt. Here we've got some nipple trays with half inch and three quarter inch nipples. Nipples are basically pre-cut to length, short sections of gas pipe 
or, or brass pipe that allow us to make real close connections on the fly. And then last but not least, we've got my cordless power tools. And again, it's all Milwaukee stuff, you know, drill, sawzall, impact driver, drill bits, flashlights, battery chargers, you name it, it's in there. One last thing, I'll show you the rear of the truck because we've got some kind of cool stuff with how we've set up the rear of the truck. All right, on the rear of the truck, we're again running a high roof transit. And part of that is we're able to store a six foot ladder vertically right in the back door of the truck. This is nice. Before we were running the high roof transits, we had to have it like long ways in here and it was just in the way. Getting to a high roof platform was great for us to give us that little bit of extra storage. This is really cool. So what we've done is we've drilled our shelving units and put these tubes in there. So now we can store all of our PVC piping, all of our copper piping and all of our PEX piping inside the shelving. So this is drilled through the shelving. These uh, 148 inch length transits will allow for 10 foot sticks of pipe from here up to the bulkhead. Keeps it nice, keeps it organized, keeps it off the floor, off the ceiling, out of the way. Transits can be a little bit difficult to store piping in, and so we found this to be the most efficient way to store it. It does take just a little bit of shelf space up, but you'll find that you can organize your shelves so that you keep small parts right underneath this tubing and you're, you're not really losing that space. And then of course, we've got a broom because we want to keep a nice tidy job site. For all the electricians out there, this is called a broom and we use this to sweep up after ourselves. If you're an electrician and you don't know what this is, Google it, it's a broom. So that completes the tour of the truck. Now that you know what's in it, let's go figure out what this thing weighs. And if you watched our previous video, we weighed this thing when it was empty, just as it came from the factory. We're gonna go weigh it again and find out what all of these parts and tools and shelving units and bulkheads, and we're gonna find out what all of that weighs. And that way we're giving you guys a loaded range, real world experience here with weight in the truck. In the first range video that we did when we were unloaded, we were talking about the possibility that the range might actually be better in the city than on the highway. And we've driven this unit enough to understand that that is indeed true. Because of the regenerative braking properties of the EV, you do get a lot more range in town than you do on the highway. One of the features, you have to turn this on in the settings for your trip odometers, but one of the features that it will tell us in this top right corner here, it will tell us that we are currently right now for this trip, we're 27, 26.9 miles into the trip. It'll tell us that we are running about two miles per kilowatt hour of energy used, okay? Well, that's an average. We've had a mixed use of highway and city throughout this morning's drive, throughout these 27 miles. One of the things that I'm gonna do here right with you guys is I'm gonna change over to trip number two. Trip number two is identical to trip number one because we reset them both this morning. But right now we are on the highway and we're driving 65 miles an hour. I'm gonna change over to trip number two and we're gonna give it a few miles. We've got a couple miles to drive here to get to the way station. We're gonna give it those few miles and I'm gonna be able to show you that on the highway, we do not achieve quite the two miles per kilowatt hour of energy. So let's go ahead and reset trip number two right now. Pushing okay to hold, all values reset on trip number two. So we're right now we're going 65 miles an hour. As we go through some uphills and some downhills here on the highway, it's gonna take it a minute to calibrate, but here in a few minutes, we're gonna be able to report back to you after about five or 10 miles of just straight highway driving at 65 miles an hour, we're gonna be able to show you that it does not quite get two miles per kilowatt hour on the highway. We've driven for about 13 miles on the highway and go ahead and look here on the, on the trip. And you see, 13 miles, we reset everything 
at 65 miles an hour. We've averaged 65 miles an hour for 13 miles straight. We've, done, we've gone some uphills, we've gone some downhills, we've gone everything. And right now, we are averaging 1.9 miles per kilowatt hour of energy used from the battery. And so that tells us a couple of things. One thing that it tells us is that we will, without a doubt, be able to achieve a 100 mile range. 1.9 is fairly close to two. So you take two miles times your 68 kilowatt hour battery, and that's gonna put you at about 130 miles of range if you were to start at 100% and use the battery the entire drive on, on the highway. That's getting zero regenerative braking the entire time because you've got the cruise parked at 65 miles an hour. One of the things, and we're gonna be able to show it to you later on today, we'll do this trip or this, this same experiment again, but we're gonna do it all inside of neighborhoods where we're starting and stopping, we're never really going over 25, 30 miles an hour, and we're constantly having to slow down for stop signs and turns. And you're gonna see that that miles per kilowatt hour actually gets up into the upper twos, lower threes, and even fours if, if the conditions are right. So the EV is actually far more efficient in neighborhoods than it is on the highway. And there's a reason for that. It's opposite of a gas vehicle. On a gas vehicle, your transmission is consuming enormous amounts of energy efficiency away from your gas engine. Your gas engine's not all that efficient anyway, but then your, your vehicle's transmission, as it has to accelerate through all the gears, it's consuming enormous amounts of energy. You know, the engine revs all the way up to three or 4,000 RPMs, and then it shifts into second gear, and then it revs up to three or 4,000 RPMs again, and then it shifts into third gear. Well, then also your torque converter in your transmission is also allowing quite a bit of slippage to make all of that happen really smoothly. Well, as that's happening, that's energy that your engine is putting out that's not being directly put to the tires. Therefore, it's robbing efficiency. The electric vehicle with its regenerative braking properties is considerably more efficient in neighborhoods, which is opposite of a gas vehicle. About a week ago, we were running in this van, unloaded, empty, just as it came from the factory, and we took it across the weigh scale. We both got out of it, we weighed it just for the van how it is. And what we found was the steer axle, the front axle, was 3,160 pounds. The drive axle was 3,180 pounds for a total gross weight of 6,340 pounds. Again, this was unloaded, and this was on 4-29-2022. That was six days ago. Today, we're gonna run it across the weigh scale again, and just for comparison, you and I will both get out of the vehicle, so we're, we're just going vehicle with its contents, and we're gonna see exactly what our setup weighs and how that affects our range. All right, we got it all weighed up again. I'm not in it again, you're not in it again. It's just the vehicle and its contents. We've got our paper. Let's jump inside and compare the two numbers. So what we've got, steer axle, 3660. Previously, that was 3160. So we're 500 pounds heavier on the steer axle. Drive axle is 4620. Okay, so we went up by 1440 pounds on the drive axle or the back axle. Combined weight rolling right now is 8,280 pounds, which is a 1,940 pound increase. All of our shelving, all of our tools, all of our uh, parts and pieces and equipment and everything weighs just under 2,000 pounds, 1,940 pounds. For comparison, the gross vehicle weight rating of this E-Transit, it's a 350 chassis, it's got a gross vehicle weight rating of 9,500 pounds. So we still have 1,220 pounds of cushion that we can have on, on the vehicle overall. We do this on purpose. As we build these plumbing trucks, we do this on purpose because there are, there are times where we have to maybe load up some concrete in the back of it after we've broken up somebody's floor 
or maybe we're hauling out some of these old cast iron drain lines and we that you know those are nice and heavy and we have to have room for that we aren't anywhere near the max capacity of the van and we're still getting really respectable range numbers so for starters let's kind of dive back in here and just give you an update as to where we're at on all of this when we started out today our range was projected that we would be able to go 122 miles well right now we are 43 44 miles into our day and we've gone or we still have 84 miles of range left so you add those up together and that's going to come up to about 128 miles of total range again we're not quite halfway through we're not even really close to halfway through our range test we're already bettering the number by eight miles so I have a feeling we're going to be able to get to about 130 or 140 miles today fully loaded in the e-transit. Now keep in mind Ford claims that you'll be able to go 108 miles on a charge. We're, we're doing better than that significantly. Alright, so as you can see, gas prices right now in our area are $4 a gallon, $3.99 a gallon. This is a prime example of why we have the all-electric vehicle, is so that we don't have to spend all of that money every week on fuel. We're out kind of showcasing what it can do. Oh, yeah. I actually haven't seen an all-electric... Brand new. They just came out with a truck thing before. Yeah. <laughs> Not besides the Tesla trucks. Yeah. Want to see under the hood? Sure. Check the hood. Oh, I like the blue right there. Yeah. No engine. Oh, wow. They've got some- You weren't kidding. Yeah. <laughs> They've got some components in there to run like the AC and the, the oh. heater and the power That's steering. pretty nice. Yeah. The engine's in the, the, the engine is an electric motor and it's in the back of it underneath. So, pretty sweet. Yeah, like I said, I've never seen an all-electric transit before. <laughs> yeah, it's, they're, it's a lot of fun, especially with gas prices like they are. Yeah. You know, our other, we've got a couple of these in our other vans. They burn like $100 a week in gas. There's I went through like 100 to 200, and not only is that truck, right. the white truck, that right. the 1997 Cavalier yeah. as well. Yeah. I also had the engine blow up on me. Oh, yeah. Don't have to worry that, about that, that with these. No yeah. transmission, no engine. That, just that's works. what I like about the electric ve electric vehicles is you don't have to worry about the engine blowing up. Or right, anything. right. But yeah. the only thing you really have to worry about is battery. Battery. Yeah. And the battery from Ford, it's got an eight-year, hundred thousand mile warranty, so we don't even have to worry about that. That's just a nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's only it's got like eight hundred miles on it. So. Oh, that's just not bad. Yeah. For, for a pretty dang new car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's brand new. You guys put 800 miles on it today? Yep. No, not today. No, we've I've had it for about a week and a half. Oh. So. So it doesn't really put that much on it. No, no, we do. We do about 300 miles a week. Well, you guys stay safe. You too. While we're here at the gas station, I did want to kind of break down some of the dollars and cents for what all of this actually means to the end user and what we're seeing. We've got just under 750 miles of experience with this unit. We're using it day in and day out through our normal operations. And so we have enough data to, to go ahead and start making some projections. We also have a lot of data with other gas transits. Keep in mind, we use gas transits for all of our other vans. Those gas transits, they average for us about 13.5 miles to the gallon. We do a lot of city in town driving, neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood. We put about 350 miles per week on each van. That comes out to be about 25.9 gallons of fuel. As we just saw, gas right now is 3.99 a gallon. So that means each week for us to roll 350 miles in a gas van, we're spending $103.70. Now, let's take a look at some of the electric numbers. What we're seeing on average for the electric van is we're seeing an average of about 2.3 miles per kilowatt hour. Again, that's with our mixed use of in-town and highway and everything. Sometimes it may be just a hair less. It just kind of depends. 
So that same 350 miles traveled each week means that we're using a total of 152 kilowatt hours of electricity each week. Just like fuel prices change drastically throughout the country, electrical prices change drastically throughout the country. So you'll wanna know what your electric rates are to make this decision. Our electric rates, we're, we're tiered based off of usage. It actually gets cheaper the more you use. And I hit that top tier every month. I've hit it every month since I've lived in the house that I live in. I can factor this just adding on to that top tier. And that top tier is .05005 dollars per kilowatt hour of energy. Basically, it's five cents per kilowatt hour of energy. We take that 0 .05005, we multiply it by the 152 kilowatt hours of energy we use each week, and what we come out to is $7.62 in electricity is what it takes for us to roll 350 miles. You compare that to $103 in fuel, and the savings are astronomical. We're saving over $95 a week in fueling costs, fuel versus electricity. We're saving over $95 a week. That savings passes a tremendous savings along to our customers. We just got done showing you guys uh, the miles per kilowatt hour of energy when you're on the highway. We reset the trip 65 miles an hour the entire way and we were like 1.9 miles per kilowatt hour of energy used when we're on the highway. We're gonna do that exact same experiment again. We're in a neighborhood now and we're literally just gonna drive circles in this neighborhood stopping at all the stop signs and turns and everything much like you would if you're a delivery driver. We're gonna show you how the miles per kilowatt hour dramatically increase when you're in a neighborhood. Let's go into trip two. We're in trip two. We're gonna reset trip two again. And we're doing all of this in trip two because trip one, we reset first thing this morning and it's kind of giving us our overall average throughout the day. Trip two is letting us give you guys some really good info and in smaller sample sizes. We've reset trip two. Now let's go put on 10 miles in the neighborhood and see what goes on. So the neighborhood that we're driving around in right now, I'm giving you guys some neighborhood range miles. Right outside of this neighborhood, there was a large estate lot that was owned privately by a gentleman. He was doing some excavation work on that estate lot quite a few years ago he discovered a mastodon skeleton underground on that estate lot. And it was kind of cool, really hot topic in the news for a while. The city actually came through and bought that land from the private individual. Uh, so now it's owned by the city, but there's always been a lot of hubbub and, and a lot of question as to whether, you know, maybe, maybe there should be further digging to look for more signs of of other fossils and other old remains from you know the ice age era and the dinosaur style era that's your history lesson today for grain valley missouri all right so another thing that we're going to do for you here is we're going to show you how quiet it is with a decimal reader so we've got a decimal reader on a phone we're going to prop it up against the stop sign here and we're going to drive to and from the area and show you just how quiet things can be All right, so as we're driving around here, grabbing some miles in the neighborhood, one of the things that we wanted to show you, that green house there in the background, that was actually my first ever house. I bought that house when I was 19. I built the barn that's on the side of it there. That barn's 12 feet wide, 24 feet long, and it's two stories. There's a big loft up on the top of it. And that's the house that I, it's my first ever house. It's the house that I got married in, and it's the house that I brought both my kids home to. So. A lot of memories in that house. Maybe one day I'll buy it back, you never know. We've worked our way through a neighborhood to get to the top of the steepest hill in Grain Valley. This hill is like really treacherous in the winter time. There's always cars off into the ditches. It's kind of funny. We're gonna take you guys down it.
we have completed 10 miles in a neighborhood. We never left the neighborhood. We maybe hit the outskirts of the neighborhood a little bit. On our trip to odometer, we just went 10 miles. We averaged 17 miles an hour, and we also averaged 2.5 miles per kilowatt hour. So on the highway, that was 1.9 miles, if I remember right, per kilowatt hour. 0.6 miles per kilowatt hour better than we were on the highway. That may not seem like much, but over 10 kilowatt hours of energy used, you're traveling an extra six miles. Over 100 kilowatt hours used, you're traveling an extra 60 miles. That's a substantial difference, and it's directly inverse of a standard gas vehicle. Gas vehicles get horrible mileage in neighborhoods, and they get better mileage on the highway. This one is actually backwards. 2.5 miles per kilowatt hour in a neighborhood, 1.9 on the highway. This train is a massive, oh, we're so squeezing through that. There's not even a train coming. Oh, it's right there. Yeah. This train is a massive point of contention for Green Valley because there's two streets that cross that train track at Green Valley and both of the streets have those crossing guards down. A train is typically, you know, three to five miles long. Trains will commonly park on the tracks and cross and, and block both crossings. And so it makes it literally impossible to get from the south side of town to the north side of town. All right, one of the other things that we wanted to show you guys is we wanted to show you about what this thing can do for acceleration. We are gonna deviate a little bit from our plan to give you guys some true range stuff because if you're really trying to go as far as you can, you wouldn't be flooring it and mashing on the gas. We know it's not gonna affect our range too, too much to do it once or twice here, so we're gonna take it out of eco mode and we're gonna put it into normal driving mode and we're gonna be able to show you exactly how fast this thing will accelerate from zero to 60. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna tap the start button on the stopwatch at the same time I mash the gas and we're gonna see what it takes. Ready? not fast. I don't know what we had going on there. We were not getting 100% power out of the battery and it took 16 seconds to go to 60 miles an hour so something is a little goofy there. We just did a 0 to 60 trip and it took us over 16 seconds to get to 60 and I was confused for a minute. Our power was only at about 75% power, 75% of max power, even though we're in normal mode. Well, I think why it took so long was because we were still in L mode. So let me turn L mode off, and then we're gonna do another zero to 60 run here. So, we got everything set back up the same way it was. All right, so L mode's off. We're in normal driving mode. Let's see how fast it accelerates now. we go. So that was 11.8 seconds, 0 to 60. And we were seeing 100% full power out of the engine, or, or motor, I should say. So L mode alone, even outside of, of normal and eco mode, L mode will reduce the power output of the electric motor and, and help conserve energy. So Let's go ahead and put things back where they were. We'll put it back into eco mode. We're back into L mode. We're back on our range test here. Ford did a really interesting thing with the acceleration of this electric transit. Everybody's heard about how crazy fast Teslas are, and, and they are, they're very fast. 
well a cargo van you wouldn't want it being insanely fast right we have tons of stuff on the shelves back there and so we wouldn't want to be throwing that stuff off the shelves if we goosed the throttle too hard ford really tapered in the amount of power that's available at the lower speeds if you were to watch the power gauge you notice it doesn't go to full power until halfway through that zero to 60 run. And that's because they don't want you to have access to full power at the lower speeds because it would just trash the back of your van and throw everything around. Time to stop and take a quick lunch break. And it wouldn't be a Kansas City based video if we didn't grab some barbecue. So if you're ever in the Blue Springs area, check out Plowboy's Barbecue on South 7 Highway. Amazing barbecue, amazing burnt ends, and they've got some barbecue nachos that are to die for. to our next stop here after that amazing Plowboys lunch. We're actually at our plumbing supply house uh, where we grab a lot of our plumbing material. And as we work down through the range, we showcased this on the last video, this particular transit has the Pro Power onboard system. And what that is, is it is two receptacles in the back of the van that have a 20 amp breaker going to it and it allows you to run power tools and everything else off of those receptacles. So if you're out on a remote job site where there, are, there is no power, you don't need to bring a generator, you can literally let the van do the work for you. One of the interesting things is the system is built to ensure that you have enough power to make it back to a charger. And so we just got a warning as we were backing into the supply house here, we just got a warning that says the Pro Power Reserve setting is two miles of charge away. And what that means is we've got, we've got 46 miles of range remaining on our journey. When you get down around 40 to 45 miles, that Pro Power onboard reserve setting will turn on and eliminate your ability to use those outlets in the back of the van. Basically, it's just making sure you have enough juice to either get home or get to a charger and that you can't run your battery all the way dead on the job site. guys have a pretty messy truck all it takes like I just got my parts my restock parts I spent what was this 40 seconds putting them all away if you do that every time then you always have a very clean and organized truck and my truck is smaller than theirs and it's got some audio video equipment in it too and I still can move around nicely and everything
Another thing we want to point out on this range video is during the first unloaded range video we did where the van was empty, we were avoiding using the heat or the AC the entire day. That day was like 55 degrees in the morning and it finished out like sunny and 75 and we were avoiding using the heat and the AC trying to get as much as we can out of it. Today, it's 95 degrees outside. We're not trying to avoid it. We've got the AC set on a very comfortable 67 degrees. It's been running all day long. It's not affecting our range much at all. Check it out right here. We're 95 degrees right now, and 95 degrees in Kansas City is usually pretty dang muggy. You definitely need AC. Because it is so hot outside today, we've got a lot of plumbers that are out there busting their heinies out in the heat right now. So we're gonna swing into the grocery store, grab some Gatorades, put them on ice for them, and go make some deliveries. Now we're off to go deliver some Gatorades to our guys that are out in the field. We've got three different plumbers that are out working today. We've got 45 miles of range remaining. Let's see if we can get to all three plumbers in our 45 miles of range. So we just completed our first Gatorade stop. We have two more that we're trying to squeeze in here. The first one consumed almost 15 miles of range. It took 13 miles of range. So we have 32 miles left. Let's see if we can make two more stops with some Gatorade. Our next one is 8.1 miles away, so we should be okay. Let's find out. Yeah, another uh, house rental. I'm gonna go find Freeman. Where's he at? I don't know, somewhere in Lee Summit. Thanks for the Gatorade. I'm done with all the hard work. Well, I need to hydrate anyway, so. There you go. It'll work. And it's Gatorade Zero, so no sugar. Oh, what kind of crap is that? All the electrolytes. That'll None work. of the sugar. I just got an estimate over by our house now. Can I interest you in a purple, a blue, or a yellow? All kinds. A man right there. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. We got one more stop to make. Timbo? Yep. Gotta go find Tim somewhere. Alright, so we just dropped off Gatorades to our second plumber out in the field. We're gonna go out and find our third plumber out in the field right now. We've got 24 miles of range left. So uh, let's hope that we can make it out to him and then back to our charger before we run out. We've got 20 miles of range left, so we're getting a low battery warning, which is coming on letting us know that, hey, we might need to find a charger here pretty soon. Yeah. 
Yeah. Haven't figured out what we're doing with toilets yet. Uh, he knows what you're doing with toilets. <laughs> We've run around to all of our guys, giving them all Gatorades. We've now pulled into one final stop for the day, which is Home Depot, to grab a couple of shelving pieces that we need for the inside of this truck. And then we're gonna head home. We've got 12 miles of range left before we head home. The van's performed flawlessly all day long. Once we get back home and get it on the charging dock, we'll be able to give you guys kind of a download of how long it takes to recharge and how long it takes to be in a position to go do all of this again. towards my house where my charger is right well the GPS that comes on board with the transit doesn't know that I have a charger at my house it's kind of interesting if I plug into the GPS if I want to go home I hit where to and I plug in my home it'll say chargers being added to this trip starting navigation it's telling me that I'm gonna drive to a charger and I'm gonna sit at that charger for an hour and 25 minutes and then drive home. The GPS is trying to navigate you in a direction that keeps you from running out of juice. As we know from our first trip that we did, it's giving me a low battery warning here, we've got 10 miles of range remaining. And so it's giving me a low battery warning. As we know from our first range video, when you ignore these commands by GPS long enough and you get far enough away from those chargers, it will basically tell you to like, you're on your own, pull over and find an outlet now because you can't make it to a charger. It's kind of funny. We're gonna make it do that again. We're gonna take kind of a longer meandering drive home just so we can run it as far out as we can. All right, it keeps popping up warnings because it's telling us that it's it's trying to route us to a charger before we get home. We have six miles of range remaining. We're about ready to get to a point where we're farther away from a charger than we are from anywhere else. There you go. Chargers are unreachable. The nearest charger is outside of your range. Please plan to find a power outlet where you can charge it's telling us we're not gonna make it to a charger before the battery's dead. Let's hope we can make it home before the battery dies. That's a new warning. The nearest charger is near the edge of your range. Find a charger or risk running out of energy. Close. One of the gauges on the dash of the e-transit, I'll pull over here to show you. One of the gauges on the dash is this left-hand gauge here. This is like your fuel gauge or your battery gauge. This gauge over here is your power gauge. And as you start running, as you can see, we've only got four miles of range remaining on this charge. And as you start running into your final 10 miles of range, it cuts into the available power it's gonna give the engine. So that left-hand lower gauge operates almost you know like an old motorcycle or an old four-wheeler would have like a reserve tank of fuel to where if you ran out of primary you'd have like you'd flip it to reserve and that was kind of your warning to say get to a gas station quickly that that left hand gauge acts kind of like your reserve tank it starts warning you saying you need to get to a charger quickly because you have very limited range left down to our final mile of range remaining. So we had to give up on the GPS that comes in the transit because it keeps trying to route us to chargers. So the GPS on my phone says we're a mile and a half from my house. I hope we can make it there.
We've completed our entire day's worth of driving. Let's look at the numbers and see what we were able to achieve for the day. We were able to go 131.3 miles, fully charged, and loaded down with 2,000 pounds of additional weight in the back of the unit. We traveled an average of 24 miles an hour, and we were able to drive about two, two miles per kilowatt hour of energy. That's pretty dang good. It's actually farther than we were able to drive empty, but without having it in eco mode and without having it in L mode. So that tells you how crucial L mode and eco mode are to getting the maximum range you can out of these things. The other thing that we can, we can take from this is two miles for every kilowatt hour of energy. Well, we have a 68 kilowatt hour battery. So if we're able to go two miles for every kilowatt hour of energy used, that should be about 140 miles of range and we've gone 130. So it also tells us that there might be about a 10 mile safety net built into that zero miles of range remaining. We might have to do another video soon where we literally drive this thing until it stops and we see how far below zero you can go. The e-transit comes from the factory with this supplied charger here. This particular charger comes in this nice carrying bag. Here is the charger assembly and then it's got two different adapters for it. One adapter will plug into a standard 120 volt wall outlet, plugs right into the top of the charger. The other adapter is a NEMA 1450 plug. It's a 40 amp plug, plugs right into the charger. 240 volts, 40 amps, it will plug right into the charger and charge it substantially faster. We did a video recently showing the approximate charge times. If we plug this in to the standard wall outlet, it takes like 74 hours to charge it from zero all the way back up to 100%. That comes out to about like 1.5 miles of range per hour of charging. And that's using your 120 volt plug. Yes, it does come with a charger from the factory. If you wanna use the factory charger, you really need to have at least a 40 amp outlet to do so. We sprung for the extra Ford connected charger over here. This guy is 240 volts. It's 48 amps. It gives us some extra amperage. It also has Bluetooth connectivity to my phone. It will alert my phone whenever the, the van is fully charged and ready to go. And it can connect and communicate a little bit with the van here. So let's get this plugged in and then we'll jump in one last time and show you how long it takes to get charged up and ready to go. We've got it plugged in. We've turned it back on. Let's check and see here. It's 0% because we've just plugged it in and it's telling us that it will it will be fully charged at 11:31 p.m. tonight. That's about seven and a half hours to charge from 0% to 100%. Plenty enough time for you to come home, plug it on the charger every night, and then it's ready to go for you the next day. And as we've just shown you, if you do in-town delivery driving and in-town service work and everything else, this is a great option for you to significantly reduce your fuel expenses.